It's day 237. It's also December 28th, 2019. And we're on a road. A road called FM 192 in Texas. You ever wake up in the morning and ask yourself, what am I doing? And more importantly, why? Yeah, me too. Hi, my name's Craig. And this is my story, a story about life, life out there. For visuals while listening, search Life Out There on your favorite social media platform or use the links in the podcast description. We continued east on Highway 9 out of Columbus, continuing our wandering stopping along the way to explore, and sometimes just to watch. Parked alongside the road just outside Santa Teresa, New Mexico one afternoon for lunch, I was studying the dirt road that drifted up into the mountains to our north, when we were surprised and fascinated to watch two Border Patrol pickups, each with trailer in tow and coming from the east, pull off the highway onto the desert across the road from us. In just minutes, the trailers had been unloaded, two saddled horses from one, and two off-road vehicles from the other, and the agents had disappeared into the desert. So curious, what or who was out there? Had the agents been alerted to activity that needed to be investigated, or were they merely out on patrol? We'd spend hours that afternoon parked in the desert, having lunch, and reading about the RV camping opportunities all around us. We'd read of places like Franklin Mountain State Park and Aguirre Spring Campground in the Oregon Mountains Desert Peaks National Monument. Camping sounded pretty amazing in both places. I also found tons of BLM opportunity within those mountains around us, Some looked to be just a few miles up that desert road to our north. But like anywhere, the higher into the mountains you venture in December, the cooler the temps, sometimes downright cold. Not to mention, weather can be unpredictable. Several hours would pass before the Border Patrol agents returned, loaded up nearly as quickly as they had unloaded, and headed back from where they came. My guess? El Paso, which I had just learned was just a few miles up the road. When pulling off the road here for a break, it had not yet occurred to me that we were about to leave New Mexico and enter Texas, slipping into that southwest corner of Texas that would suddenly put the New Mexico border to our north and all of Texas and Mexico to our south. And learning that over 600,000 Texans call El Paso home and that just across the border from El Paso, you'll find the nearly 1.5 million people that call Ciudad Juarez Chihuahua home in Mexico. Wow! Considering that we were not far away from nearly a quarter of a million humans, and apparently a much busier part of this desert southwest, we'd likely just slip past El Paso and keep looking for our next quiet spot. But that said, a quick read about El Paso, and one could probably be pretty easily convinced to stick around a while and check it out. Who wouldn't want to check out the spot near present-day El Paso, on which the Spanish explorer Juan de Oñata and his expedition would celebrate the very first ever Day of Thanksgiving in North America? Crazy, right? Thanksgiving in America? in my head, was born of images of American pilgrims breaking bread with Native Americans in Plymouth, Massachusetts, in celebration of the season's bountiful harvest. All of which is true and accurate. It's been tracked back to 1621 being the first known Thanksgiving, pilgrim style. I didn't know the part about, it wasn't an annual thing. In in fact, Thanksgiving would be celebrated pretty sporadically throughout the colonies for years, 
apparently only when deemed warranted. It wouldn't be until 1863, during the Civil War, that President Lincoln would proclaim the fourth Thursday of each November a national day of Thanksgiving. And it would be another 78 years, in 1941, when it would be declared a national holiday by the U.S. Congress. And why Turkey? Well, it turns out those pilgrims were pretty practical. It was all about abundance. Seems North America was loaded with wild turkeys at the time, so they were pretty readily available. And the size of the bird typically meant that one could easily feed a family. And not to mention that those other meat sources of the time, cows and chickens, well, those guys were dual purpose, the whole milk and eggs thing. So why not feast on one of those other birds, the bigger ones, the ones they didn't feed all year? And turkey would actually not become a part of the celebration until later on. That first documented Thanksgiving centered around cod, roasted goose, and lobster. So, yeah, two very different celebrations, for different reasons. Within the Spanish culture, a day of Thanksgiving dates deep into their Catholic heritage. The celebration can be held any time and for any reason. It's considered a celebration of blessings. So, technically, the first recorded day of Thanksgiving feast that took place in North America, well, it happened 23 years prior to the one in Massachusetts, over here in El Paso, on April 30th, 1598, when that Spanish explorer and his expedition celebrated a day of Thanksgiving after a grueling journey across the Chihuahua Desert and successfully reaching and crossing the Rio Grande. Or was it the first? Because then there's that one more click thing, read a little more. And it seems that the folks in St. Augustine, Florida, might have something to say about the claim being made over here in El Paso. History also documents a day of Thanksgiving feast followed by Mass on September 8, 1565, 33 years prior to when they hit the table over here, forks and knives in hand, in El Paso. And those folks in St. Augustine... They were giving thanks for the safe arrival of a Spanish explorer named Pedro Menendez de Avia and his 800 settlers, who had just successfully navigated the Atlantic Ocean and landed in what they named La Florida, translated the Flowery One. But then, in time, Americans would apply a bit of, what was that called? Phonetic simplification? And La Florida would become... Florida. And not to make light of the significance of the date and the celebration held here in El Paso, the community still does, indeed, to this day celebrate the historic event each year, honoring the significance of their forefathers' arrival in the area. That expedition of over 400 that left Santa Barbara, Mexico, and traveled for over four months, successfully traversing some 1,500 miles to become a critical part of the colonization of the American Southwest. And in celebrating this remarkable achievement, the community often refers to the event as their first Thanksgiving. So basically, folks in El Paso, they get two Thanksgivings every year. But enough about Thanksgiving. El Paso is also home to the Isleta Mission, established in 1682. This mission is the oldest continuously operated parish in Texas. And Fort Bliss also calls El Paso home. In 1849, the U.S. military established the fort, and it's grown into one of the largest military complexes in the United States, spanning some 1,700 square miles. So big that portions of it even extend into New Mexico. And you know me. When I read something is one of the largest, well, I had to know where even larger military complexes might be. So I asked the internet for the five largest in the world, measured by land size and population. Now, I loved reading that all five are right here in the U.S., but was also interested to learn that when I asked the internet the largest not in the United States, well, that's a complex in the Astrakhan region of Russia. It's called Kapustin Yar. 
But when I asked how big that facility is, the internet told me, quote, that information is not readily available, close quote. So I'll just have to go with these five largest are of the ones we know of. And the largest? Fort Liberty, formerly known as Fort Bragg in North Carolina. This base is home to over 260,000 people and covers 163,000 acres. And then there's Fort Campbell, which actually extends the borders of Kentucky and Tennessee. 235,000 folks call that base home, and it covers 102,414 acres. And third, Fort Cavazos, formerly known as Fort Hood, also in Texas. 218,000 acres and nearly 46,000 personnel. And number four, Joint Base Lewis McCord in Washington State, also referred to as JBLM. This place is home to over 125,000 personnel and covers a whopping 415,000 acres. And finally, Fort Moore, formerly Fort Benning, Georgia. Over 130,000 personnel call this 182,000 acres home. And while El Paso's fort may not be in the top five, it is the ninth largest. And another interesting statistic around El Paso revolves around the arrival of four railways in the area in 1881. The sudden and massive increase in commerce through the area would lead to a bit of a boom, and the town's population would increase by tenfold in just the following few years, when the little town of El Paso would now be home to over 10,000 new residents. And finally, I'd read about the Chamizal dispute. As I so often learn, if you dig around long enough, you'll find fun factoids, fascinating, sometimes even tragic pieces of history that has somehow gotten lost in the history books. At least the ones I learned from. In this particular series of events, well, it caught my eye for a couple of different reasons, I think. First, it is a twisty, turny, up and down and back and forth series of exchanges between the United States and Mexico that spanned over a hundred and four years. And it all began at the hands of Mother Nature. By 1864, the U.S. border with Mexico had been fairly well established, whether it be via the U.S. victories in the Mexican-American War or the Gadsden Purchase. Boundaries down here were pretty clear and respected. But then, a major flood would occur in 1864. A weather pattern and the resulting flood would be so intense that it literally caused the Rio Grande River, the border between the countries, to change course. The river actually moved south, and this would begin a century-long dispute over where the boundaries between the two countries actually were. And it didn't help that the river would continue to shift and to pretty continuously move that boundary between the two nations. Now, in those 600 acres of Mexican territory and its residents had cleaned up after the initial flood and suddenly found themselves on the other side of the border in America? Well, it's easy to see how things could get complicated. In short order, American settlers, being the go-getters they were, would actually begin showing up in and attempting to settle land as their own. And at the same time, that little city of El Paso, well, it was doing some encroaching of its own. And those Mexican landowners, well, they kind of found themselves in the middle of a nightmare. A nightmare that would last over a hundred years. The area would become known and referred to as El Chamizal, Loosely translated, the term referred to a shrub that was abundant in the area, a shrub known for its ability to thrive in the salty soil deposited by the Rio Grande River, a plant also known for its deep root system, oftentimes reaching some 15 feet into the earth, which helped to stabilize the soils protecting against erosion. Now, it seems clear to me that the term was applied by Mexican landowners to symbolize not only their resilience, but their commitment to the land that was theirs, and they fully believed still was. 
Now, I read this much of the story and wondered why would such a dispute take two countries, friendly, allies even, so long to come to a resolution. But then I went on to read that lawyers in both countries, and worse yet, politicians in each country, would unavoidably get involved. At that point, I guess the question of how it could possibly take that long eh, became a little bit less of a mystery. It would be decades of legal wranglings and reinterpretation of the treaties that had established the border lines in the first place. And all the while, the affected residents would be left in the crossfire, essentially out in the cold, to deal with life on their land and the encroachment of it with their own attorneys. And it certainly did not help that all the while Mother Nature, well, she just kept at it, continuously shifting that Rio Grande River. Now to say that over this period of time, tensions would rise and tempers would flare would be an understatement. Multiple attempts at resolution had failed when in 1909, during yet another attempt at resolution, the Taft-Diaz Summit would be held. Meetings would take place in El Paso, Texas in the United States and Ciudad Juarez in Chihuahua, Mexico. The two presidents would then meet on neutral soil in the affected area of El Chamizal, where an assassin would attempt to take the lives of both presidents. Now, while unsuccessful, the attempt on the lives of the presidents highlighted just how heated things had become in the area, and yet the dispute would continue to drag on. The summit had not resolved the dispute, but it was notable in the fact that it represented the first time an American and a Mexican president had ever met face to face. It would also come to symbolize and reinforce each nation's commitment to resolving the dispute peacefully. But another 54 years would pass before an official resolution would be signed. Cities and communities would grow all around the area. Cultures in the area would meld and communities would figure out how to just make it work until these two nations, with their politicians and attorneys, got their act together. The U.S. would continue to operate under the belief that the area was U.S. territory, if going by the letter of the law in the treaty that stated the Rio Grande was indeed the border. And then finally, in 1963, at the hands of President Kennedy and in negotiation with the President of Mexico, Adolfo López Mateos, the Chamizal Treaty would be agreed upon and signed. But then, because I guess there had not been enough craziness and time invested in this process, President Kennedy would be assassinated before the treaty could be ratified. But thankfully, ratification would take place the following year in 1964 when President Johnson would finish what President Kennedy had started. And three years later, in 1967, 630 acres of land would be turned back over to Mexico, along with a $4.5 million check. Within the treaty, the U.S. had agreed to compensate the Mexican government in an effort to help with relocation efforts, infrastructure improvements, and perhaps in some small measure, restore what had been taken away from the country all those years ago. Also within the treaty, each country committed to building a memorial on each side of the Rio Grande in remembrance of who had been affected and what the two nations had learned. And while the process was painfully and quite frankly ridiculously long, it left generations of landowners that would not live to see the final resolution. But yet, at the same time, proving that two nations can work together peacefully to resolve issues, regardless of the cause, without warfare and loss of life. And one last hope, for me anyways, next time, if there is one, maybe resolve it a little quicker? Oh, and that one last lesson. Within the negotiation of the Chamizal Treaty, four miles of that wandering Rio Grande River and border would be confined to a concrete canal beneath the bridge that now connects the two countries and those two cities, one American and one Mexican. It might take Mother Nature a little bit longer this time to shift that border encased in concrete. It's crazy how much I had just read, how much I had just learned. In between walks with Doogie, 
alongside a road in the desert southwest some three or four miles away from another country. All the while, waiting for a few border patrol agents to come back from patrol and hoping, yet again, they'd want to come see what these three yahoos were doing messing about the desert. But nope, still don't find us curious enough, I guess. We'd actually decide to stay put for dinner and spend the night there on that little piece of desert. And the following morning? Snow? Who'd have thunk it? We'd hit the road shortly after breakfast, skirt by El Paso, gazing off into the city all around us, but keeping to the highway, watching the mountainside shift from shades of brown to skiffs of white under the soft flurry of snow. But that scenery didn't last long. As the sun heated up and things were beginning to look more desert-like again, we passed a sign, the Sierra Blanca Checkpoint ahead. And as we exited the freeway and approached that checkpoint, that one big question of mine was being answered. I had been curious. It had been nearly 300 miles from Bisbee, Arizona, and we had trekked across two states and were entering a third, touching that Mexican border all over the place here and there, and wondering all the while. No one, of the Border Patrol persuasion anyways, had paid any attention to us. This 30-year-old, 32-foot-long, big metal box on wheels that we call Vacilando had not drawn a second look, not even a wave, from anyone in one of those green and white Border Patrol trucks. Perhaps all part of the plan. They'd catch us here. Well, if we were doing anything to catch, we'd pull into that check station and for the first time, be inspected. A Border Patrol agent approached the driver's side window and asked for license and registration, please. And then he asked if his partner may have a look around inside Vasilando. No problem. He's not allergic to cats or dogs, right? I unlocked the door, invited the agent in, and it was interesting watching his training at work. As he engaged in conversation with me, eye contact shifting between myself and the contents of Vasilando, all the while asking permission to open up doors and cabinets here and there, closets, the bathroom, simultaneously making friends with Doogie. Billy, uncharacteristically, was not interested. He had retreated to his safety spot below the driver's seat. It was also interesting to watch in the side mirrors as agents ran mirrors with some sort of scanner on them along the sides of Vasilando inspecting his undercarriage, and at the same time instructing that four-legged canine partner of theirs to check out the exterior storage areas along Vasilando's sides. Pulling out of that check station, I guess I was maybe even a little relieved that finally, after 300 miles in three states, somebody actually seemed interested in what we might have been carting around the desert in this big metal box. Also interesting, in our nearly 1,200-mile trek across Texas, that this would be the last time we would be stopped and inspected here in Borderland. We would stay on I-10 only long enough to ensure that we had safely escaped any semblance of serious population, when our wandering nature would take over once again and we'd randomly exit the interstate. Now I wasn't even really keeping track of where we exited or what roads we took or even what direction we were going for that matter. When I'd pass a road sign reading FM 192. And here we were, on a narrow road winding our way off into the horizon. Not so much deserty feeling at this point. The landscape was changing, it was shifting, starting to feel more like farmland and ranches, rather than surrounded by the jagged mountains of the desert. Well, those were slowly being replaced by the rolling mountains of wherever we are in Texas. We meandered along that FM-192 for miles, stopping here and there to check out the scenery and that body of water that had appeared alongside us, taking the place of the occasional farmhouse or ranch that we had driven past just a few miles back. And then, rounding a corner, we'd come to an abrupt interruption in our meandering, in the form of a road sign that read, Road Closed Ahead. And just a couple hundred feet or so beyond that road closed sign, our road 
seemed to have disappeared. It had simply immersed itself in that body of water that had appeared alongside us. That body of water that had initially looked like a river, maybe, now looked more like a lake. And it had fully consumed this FM-192. Doogie and I would take a quick walk up to the shores of this apparently newly formed lake. I found myself chuckling as we walked past that big orange road close sign, thinking two things. First, duh. And second, perhaps a more strategically placed road sign some 20 miles back would have been a bit more effective. But nonetheless, here we were. Returning to Vasilando and realizing that we'd have to execute a rather time-consuming process. And not for the first time. We'd first executed this process when met with the unmarked dead-end road in a small RV park in Ocean Shores, Washington. Now anyone that has towed a vehicle on a tow dolly behind an RV knows that reverse in this scenario? Well, it's tricky enough when attempting even just a few feet. But hundreds of feet or more? There's a much quicker, although a lot more labor-intensive, solution. Unstrap the car from the car dolly, unload the car, turn the car around and park it out of the way, unhook the car dolly from the RV and push it out of the way, then execute a 16-point turn in a 32-foot RV on a two-lane highway with minimal shoulder, and pull up a few feet, now facing the desired direction. Reattach the car dolly and drive the RV up past the car you'd parked out of the way, reload the car on the tow dolly and strap it back in. And just like that, 20 or 30 minutes later, you're all set, headed in the opposite but desired direction. Now having traveled, I don't know, most of the morning and facing this process, I decided I'm hungry. So it would be first a longer walk with Doogie, then lunch, then a relaxing afternoon of reading alongside a newly formed little lake somewhere in Texas before executing Operation Turnaround and heading back out towards the interstate. And the first thing I would read, that FM stands for Farm to Market. Apparently, it's a Texas thing. This particular Farm to Market road, according to Google Maps and the Internet, is located in Hudspeth County, Texas. It starts at State Highway 20 in McNary, Texas, and runs southeastward through Esperanza, covering a distance of some 25 and a half miles. The road was originally designated in 1946, but has undergone several revisions and redesignations since. Farm Road, or Farm to Market Road, specifically in Texas, is part of the state's system of secondary and connecting routes built and maintained by the Texas Department of Transportation. Texas established this system in 1949 to improve access to rural areas providing local farmers with a more dependable roadway for transporting their product to larger marketplaces. These roads can also sometimes be referred to as ranch roads. The system consists of primarily paved two-lane roads, although some segments have more lanes and some are even considered freeways today. Texas contains over 79,000 miles of ranch or farm-to-market roads, and the oldest of which is FM 1960, a farm road completed in 1937 during the Great Depression. The road runs through several cities in what is now the Houston metropolitan area and has evolved from a rural country road into the major urban thoroughfare it is today. Now, some info out there started to become a bit contradictory. Like, for example, which was actually the first and the oldest and how many miles of it there are. But I wasn't much interested in getting too buried in all that and trying to sort it out. What was fun to learn for me was that Texas, some 80 plus years ago, had come up with actually a very smart plan to fund a system of roads that would connect large expanses of an enormous state. They understood the importance of connecting farmers to the larger commerce areas of the state, allowing every Texan the opportunity to farm and ranch anywhere in the 261,568 square miles that the nation calls Texas. And translated, that's 172 million acres. And Texas figured out a way to connect them all. 
Now, it's not hard to believe that while reading all this data about roads in Texas, I'd also come across the unsurprising statistic that Texas, the nation's second largest state, is also home to the most extensive interstate system in the country, containing more miles of interstate than any place else in the country. 3,238.7 miles of interstate, to be exact. Oh, and another quick fact, more road signs, by far, than any other state in the country. And here we go again. The internet had just told me that Texas has more interstate than any other state. So guess who asked the internet what states held the top five slots? Texas, of course. Then California with around 2,455.7 miles. Illinois with 2,203.4 miles. Pennsylvania, roughly 1,757 miles. And finally, Ohio, with approximately 1,572.4 miles. That was interesting, because after California, I don't think I'd have gotten any of those other three right. But for us, these farm roads were just an escape from the congestion of I-10 coming out of El Paso. And after a couple of hours of reading and relaxing, I decide that break time was over and set out to execute Operation Turnaround. And some 30 minutes later, it was back out towards the interstate for us. As night fell, we'd made it around 150 miles east-ish, stopping off along the way in places like Van Horn, Alamore, Saragossa, Sierra Blanca, and calling it a day in Pecos, Texas. I'd already googled a spot to park for the night as we pulled into Pecos, a large parking area on an old fairgrounds. As we pulled into the parking area, we drove past a monument with a bronzed plaque proclaiming Pecos, the site of the world's first rodeo. And settling in later that night, after some dinner, I was thinking back to Prescott, Arizona, and remembered learning there that Prescott was home to the world's oldest rodeo. And yet Pecos claims to be home of the world's first rodeo. Huh. I've already got some more reading to do. Ah, the first time ever in Pecos, Texas. And I wonder what we'll learn here. Turns out, this thing called life comes with a lot of rules. Maybe it's time to break a few. Because you can. <laughs> no, seriously. You can.